Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to session number five of uh, MSoft. And since we are late, we'll start uh, right now with the first talk. The first talk is given by uh, Jiwon Kim. Uh, it's titled DINLIB, Maximizing Energy Availability for Hybrid lithium ion uh, Battery uh, System. And Jiwon Kim received the BS degree in Electronic Engineering from uh, Iwa Women's University in Seoul, Korea in 2016, and she's currently pursuing the PhD with the Yongsi uh, University in Seoul also. Her current research interests include uh, energy storage management and optimizing energy efficiency for mobile systems. Uh, Jiwon, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad to introduce my work, Maximizing Energy Availability of Hybrid Lithium-Ion Battery Systems. I'm the first author, Jiwon Kim, from Yongsi University. Uh, these days, lithium-ion batteries are employed in many applications due to their high energy density. So a wide range of uh, bat uh, battery power devices from smart devices to electric vehicles use the lithium-ion batteries. However, the available battery capacity changes depending on the two operational factors, the temperature and discharge current. Looking at the graph on the left, a lithium-ion battery can operate in a specific voltage range typically 4.2 to 3 volt. Uh, this graph shows the battery voltage when they're charging at high temperature with low discharge current conceptually. And the uh, graph on the right shows the uh, battery voltage when they're charging at a low temperature with high discharge current. Uh, the important thing is that the lower the temperature and the higher the discharge current, the greater the voltage drop. Uh, this leads to a decrease in the available energy of the battery. Uh, in fact, there are several lithium-ion battery types, and they have different performance, including the tolerance to the operational factors. The six letter chart on the screen show the performance of the uh, six major battery types, and the graphs on the bottom left shows the available capacity of four of them. As shown in the graph, uh, depending on the battery type, uh, the changes in available capacity according to the current rate and temperature are different. The important thing is that uh, we can also see that the batteries with higher energy density tend to have lower operational tolerance. So we need to choose between the energy density and uh, operational tolerance when using an electron battery. If so, what about using hybrid batteries? Uh, here is an example. Uh, assume that there are three batteries having, a, having the same mass or volume. Uh, one with high energy battery, uh, uh, high energy density, and another with high operational tolerance. The last one is a hybrid battery, which consists of uh, uh, high energy battery and high tolerance battery having the same capacity. Uh, if we if we use these three batteries under the mild condition, like discharging at high temperature with low current rate, uh, the single type high energy battery will provide the highest energy capacity. In contrast. If we use the batteries under the harsh condition, like a discharging at low temperature with high current rate, uh, the single type high tolerance battery will perform the best. The performance of the hybrid battery will always be in between the two, and it depends on the mixture ratio between the two types of batteries. So uh, providing a high energy capacity and operational tolerance at the same time is not possible, even for a hybrid battery. Uh, to see if the energy availability could be improved on the hybrid battery, we conducted an energy transfer experiment with uh, two different types of batteries. Uh, for the high energy density side, the, the LFP battery was used, but it's uh, susceptible to low temperature. And for the high tolerance, the LTO battery was used, but it has low energy density. We set up the experiment with two different scenarios as shown in the figure on the left. The first scenario is just to use fully charged high energy battery, LFP, to power the device operating with 12 watts. And the second scenario is to use high total battery LTO to power the device after the energy transfer from LFP to LTO with a low current rate. The experiment result, which is on the right, shows the corresponding battery voltages in the two uh, scenarios. Interestingly, despite the energy loss for energy transfer, the second scenario shows the better result than first. This means that the degraded cap energy capacity of a high energy battery can be recovered by transferring a high tolerant battery. So in this work, we design a, a hybrid battery system which provides high energy 
under various conditions by exploiting the energy transfer. To this end, we address two following challenges. Uh, first, uh, we should find the optimal capacity ratio optimal capacity ratio of, uh, of high energy battery and high total battery. Uh, this will determine the top, uh, total energy capacity of the hybrid battery system. And second, we should manage the battery energy considering the operational factors at runtime. The value capacity of the battery element changes depending on the runtime operational factors. So management strategy finally determine the battery availability of the hybrid battery. To address the challenges, we propose the ILIP system that consists, that, that consists of three components. The first is the battery selection, and the second is the application profile-based battery configuration. Uh, these two components is about what type or capacity of the batteries should be used to construct a hybrid battery to enhance the energy availability. The last is the runtime energy measurement, which adaptively controls battery energy at one time to maximize the energy efficiency. The, bat the battery selection is very simple. We define two different batteries with, with uh, different performance. The main energy storage is the battery that can provide high energy capacity with higher energy density. And the auxiliary energy storage is the battery with a higher operational tolerance. Uh, the total energy capacity of a hybrid battery is determined by the capacity ratio of main and auxiliary energy storage. Uh, previously, we observed the two battery properties. The first one was that the degraded capacity of a uh, high energy battery can become reusable after the energy transfer to the high total of the battery. And the second one was that the larger the capacity of high high total and battery, the lower the cap, uh, lower the total capacity of the hybrid battery. So our key idea is to minimize the capacity of the auxiliary energy storage and make the most of it with uh, energy transfer. Considering energy transfer, the capacity of the auxiliary energy storage is sufficient to store the uh, degraded capacity of the main energy storage. So this means that the minimum capacity of the auxiliary energy storage is the uh, maximum degraded capacity of the main energy storage. The application profile we define is uh, the ranges of the expected ambient temperature and device power. The maximum degraded capacity of a battery is the capacity when discharging at lowest temperature uh, with the uh, highest current rate. So we determine the capacity rate ratio by set the capacity of the auxiliary energy storage to the maximum degraded capacity of the main energy storage. Uh, <clears throat> and next, we manage, manage the battery energy at one time by developing the efficient energy transfer function for hybrid energy storage system. Uh, we first design a reconfigurable hardware for reducing the power liquid during energy transfer. Uh, the hardware, hardware support dual mode operation on, uh, on normal conditions. The hardware operates in discharge mode like the conventional skip. Uh, when the energy should be transferred, the hardware operates in transfer mode that bypasses the uh, uh, DC DC converter to reduce the power leakage. Next, we develop an energy control strategy that considers uh, both energy efficiency and runtime conditions. Uh, in discharge mode, our system distributes the power proportionally to the runtime available energy to the batteries. Uh, most existing energy management, ma management techniques uh, focus to minimize the power leakage, to, leakage when discharging the batteries. However, such optimization without considering the different internal resistance of the batteries leads to uh, the bias power load. Uh, on the other hand, uh, energy transfer causes the energy loss in any case. So to avoid unnecessary energy loss, we limit the transferred energy to the expected degraded energy of the main energy storage at runtime. Uh, we implemented the prototype hardware to evaluate the functionality uh, and the performance of our technique, as shown in the picture on the left. And the um, uh, experimental environment was set up like the picture on the right. Uh, we reproduced the battery discharge of a real experiment using a battery cycler. And the temp uh, ambient temperature was controlled with the temperature chamber. We first evaluated the pro 
proposed technique we have two applications drone and electric scooter by comparing the existing single type battery system uh, the type of the main air storage and the beta baseline were the battery types uh, typically used in the applications and auxiliary energy storage or LTO batteries in both applications. The detailed configuration is written on the paper. Uh, the experimental results are in the graphs uh, uh, for the uh, draw application in a case at zero degrees. Uh, we can see that the existing single type battery was terminated only at 504 seconds. Uh, on the other hand, Dali extends the battery lifetime to 845 seconds by distributing power and transferring the energy. Overall, the proposed technique shows average, average energy gain of 27.2% uh, uh, compared to the single type battery system. Uh, besides, we conducted uh, a further analysis based on simulator. We evaluated the effect of uh, uh, application profile based battery configuration by comparing the other configurations. And, and then we evaluated the effect of our energy management technique with two baselines. Uh, for the detail of the result, please refer to the paper. So in conclusion, we, we propose a hybrid energy storage system daily, maximizing the energy availability. For designing hybrid energy storage, we propose application profile-based battery configuration to secure the the total energy capacity of uh, hybrid, hybrid energy storage. And for energy measurement, we first designed uh, configurable hardware uh, that supports dual mode operation for efficient energy transfer. And then we propose an energy measurement method considering the battery properties and runtime conditions. Finally, we evaluated the efficacy of dialy with the, the prototype hardware and the simulator. Uh, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thank you for your for your paper. Do do we have questions in the room? I'm not sure. I know how to check. So I, I do have a question. So so first, let, let me uh, uh, congratulate you for your paper, which was a, a nice balance of um, science and uh, engineering. It's very nice to have. Uh, paper with a, a very strong uh, engineering emphasis. Computer science is also engineering. So the question I have is the following. So to design a battery system, could you formulate a global design space uh, exploration problem? So based on the characteristics of the available batteries, the converters and the desired embedded systems. And for instance, I see no reason to limit your system to two battery types. Uh... Uh, uh, actually, the uh, the we uh, our goal is uh, make making the uh, battery that can provide high and stable uh, energy, and uh, if we uh, to provide high energy, we should use the uh, battery with high energy density, and uh, to provide uh, stable ener energy, we should use the uh, battery that can provide uh, high operational tolerance. This is the, uh, uh, related to the energy availability. So we choose these two performance for, for making the hybrid battery system. Yeah, yeah, that's the, it. yeah, yeah. The, the, this I understand, but, but okay. So there, um, okay. My mistake was to have two questions in one. So let's focus on just one question is um, starting from the entire set of available batteries and converters. Could you formulate a global design space exploration problem to say, okay, for this kind of um, desired systems, uh, knowing the characteristics of the, of, of the system's operation, can I formulate, well, can you formulate a, a design space exploration problem to uh, decide what is the optimal configuration of your battery system? Uh, okay. Um, uh, actually, the, the um... Uh, there are so many devices uh, uh, that using the use the that use lithium ion batteries. So actually, I, I don't think the uh, optimal configuration is uh, uh, is uh, it, it depends on the application. So we just we just try to uh, maximize the energy availability by the 
this uh, application profile based uh, uh, better configuration technique. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, you are questioning that. You are questioning that. Uh, can 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 we use the uh, drill more batteries in this in this configuration? Yeah, that, that was a, that was the second part of the question. Is here you focus on your in your in your paper you focus on um, a battery system with two levels of batteries. Uh, yeah, okay. one and the and the and the and the and the, and the kind of backup one and the, with transfer from one to the other, but could you yes. generalize this to have more than uh, two battery types, three, four? I don't know how many layers. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Which of course would, would make the system more complex. Uh, 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 the uh, I think the goal of uh, making a hybrid battery system is the. Uh, uh, pick the advantages of uh, battery characteristics uh, and uh, it, uh, explore it by exploring these uh, advantages uh, we can uh, raise up the performance but uh, if we okay. if we use okay for instance for instance okay. batteries have different uh, modes of uh, different uh, advantages depending on the operating temperature Okay, depending on the ambient temperature, some batteries are more efficient okay. than others. So, for instance, could you have instead of two batteries to have three batteries, a main one and two auxiliary ones, and okay. your hardware would switch uh, from the two between the two auxiliaries depending on the ambient temperature? Could this be doable? Uh, I think it in it another policy. Um, yeah, of course, it would be another policy. That's my point. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That, that's entirely uh, my point. You. That would be an, another policy. That would be another uh, uh, okay. optimization problem. That's exactly uh, okay. my point. Uh, okay. Thank you for your question. Okay. Okay. So thank you again. And uh, we can uh, then move to the second paper. Second paper is uh, stock. Um, do, do, okay. First, do we have questions in the room? But, but, I have one. Ah, okay. I'm actually the next presenter as well. Okay, go on. So a brief one, uh, possibly. So first of all, thanks a lot for the excellent talk, Kim. Um, the question that I am really I have is the following. So, if for example I know that what is the capacity that I need and what are the environmental parameters that I'm going to experience or my node is going to experience over a span of let's say six months or so. And I know the minimum battery capacity that I need to have for the system to operate well. So uh, if these two parameters are known, then can your framework provide the battery configuration? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't catch your question exactly. So can you, can you repeat the sure. question? So if I know two things, one thing is the battery capacity, the usable battery capacity that I need to have. Uh, over a period of six months, let's say. And I also know the environmental parameters, for example, the temperature variations and the, also the consumption parameters, which means that how my consumption is going to go up and down. If I know these three things, then can your framework provide me with a battery configuration, like the high density battery and the high reliability battery, the, the combination of both, can, can, it, can this be provided by your framework? Uh, hmm. uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it designed for uh, the existing exact problem. Uh, and uh, we designed the battery at the design time. So the, uh, when we operate the, this hybrid battery system, uh, we, uh, we we uh, we control the the system uh, uh, depending depending on the uh, runtime operational factors. So yeah, I, yeah. All right, sure. Uh, um, thanks. Yes. 
Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you all. So we can move to the next paper, uh, which is uh, stochastic guarantees for adaptive energy harvesting systems. The talk will be given by uh, Rehan Ahmed. I hope I pronounced it well. So Dr. Uh, Rehan Ahmed is currently uh, assistant professor at uh, Information Technology University in uh, Punjab, Pakistan. He received his bachelor degree in electrical engineering from the University of Engineering and Technology in Lahore, Pakistan. And then he masters and PhD uh, at the University of uh, Wisconsin Madison in the US. And then he has been a postdoctoral researcher at the Teach Laboratory at ETH Zurich. And his main research interests are real-time embedded computing systems. Dr. Uh, Hamed, uh, Ryan Hamed, your, the floor is yours. All right, thanks a lot. Am I audible? Yes. Oh, perfect. So thanks a lot, uh, Aline. So uh, the work that I'm going to present today uh, is done with my collaborator, Stefan Vaskovic and Luther Thiele from ETH Zurich. And this is going to talk about basically how we can bring, uh, make energy harvesting systems more reliable. So the premise is the following. We have now sensing devices in many diverse environments. And in some of these diverse environments, we cannot really assume the existence of uh, a persistent and a reliable source of power. So in some other environments, this can be assumed, but in general, the problem holds. And uh, what we want to do is basically power these devices using uh, for long-term operation using alternate sources. So this research problem has been attacked by several researchers over the past decades. Uh, in general, people have come up with three uh, domains of, uh, of policies. First one is predictive with, where uh, basically energy harvesting is used and they try to predict, researchers try to predict the amount of energy which will be received over the next uh, uh, sub, a certain time intervals. And based on the prediction, they try to uh, model the power uh, consumption. Reactive schemes are also there that try to uh, modulate the system uh, operation based on some modality, for example, the battery level. And more recently, some long-term schemes have also been produced that try to model the environment. And then based on the model, try to uh, find out, or in some sense, optimize the operation. So this work uh, that I'm going to present today uh, lies in the third category, which is the long-term operation of energy harvesting devices. So the overarching goal is the following. We, what we want to do is we want to guarantee a certain minimum level of service, uh, which means that uh, if I have a node out there in, in, the, in the open, what is the minimum, uh, what is the maximum energy consumption that I can always support such that my battery is not depleted? And what, I, what we also wanted to have uh, for these schemes is some sort of a quantification of risk. So if I have a certain energy consumption, what is the probability per se for the battery to be depleted? So uh, <clears throat> moving on to the uh, concrete research goals uh, in this work, basically what we do is we develop a stochastic analysis framework, which can provide several statistical parameters for operation. For example, the average uh, energy consumption uh, within a certain time frame, or the probability of battery de depletion. Uh, we also develop an adaptive energy management policy uh, which uses this framework. We compare this against existing energy management policies, and we also explore certain design choices. So uh, a detailed design space exploration for the energy harvesting node is also done, uh, and I'll be discussing these results later on. In the interest of time, basically, I'll be just moving, uh, I'll just be explaining points A and point B. For B and C, of course, uh, you're more than welcome to go over the paper. So moving on to the model, uh, the energy harvesting environment is modeled stochastically using historical data. So what we do in this case, since we are focusing on long-term operation, we try to develop models for every single week uh, for a given location. So on the right, right here, what we see is uh, basically the different stochastic models that we have for the different weeks of the year. Uh, for I believe the location in this case is Madison, Wisconsin. Um, now, Based on this, since energy harvesting uh, is a stochastic model, we also developed stochastic models for energy storage, which would, for example, give us the probability of battery depletion. The load is also stochastic in nature, and that gives us some uh, 
more ways of modeling the load, or more general ways of modeling the load. So specifically, we try to develop a Markov model and this has certain advantages. So for instance, uh, if a node is consuming certain energy, then this can be modeled as a Markov chain where uh, the battery is, so as you can see, the, the next battery is lower than the current battery. And that's why we're, that signifies that we are consuming energy. Now, in this case, the, uh, we are also encountering some failure, which is on the uh, upper left corner. Now, we can also model some more interesting uh, consumption behaviors. For example, we can model an emergency mode, which in this case, this is the normal operation, this is the emergency operation. And basically, if we are below state 12, which is indicated over here, we are uh, trying to conserve our battery and we are not consuming anything. So the node is basically just waiting for the battery to fill up. Now, harvesting can also be modeled as a transition matrix in a Markov chain. So here we basically increase the energy. Um, the general battery ev evolution follows the following simple equation. So if we want to compute the battery for time n plus one, we, what we do is take the battery at time n and then just multiply it with the harvesting transition and the consumption transition. Now, this is uh, overly simplified. The reason for that is that um, in the paper, you'll see that uh, we compute the, 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 the aggregation of harvesting and consumption matrix and we compute this pessimistically. So essentially within a week, if we are harvesting certain energy and if we are consuming certain energy, then the harvesting is not constant because obviously we have the day and night pattern and weather change patterns during the week. The consumption may also not be constant. So what we basically do is under certain assumptions, try to find the worst case uh, transition matrix for a week. And the details for that are given in the paper. Now, this is just giving an example of how the computations can be done. So effectively, we have a battery, certain level of battery, uh, uh, the initial battery in this case. We have a certain harvesting uh, uh, random variable. So in this case, effectively, we are harvesting zero energy with a probability of 0 0.023 and so on. Now, the use is dependent on the current battery and the time as well. So n, in this case, signifies the discrete time interval for which we are doing the evaluation. So in this particular case, if our battery is between states zero and two, we are uh, using zero energy. And if we are ha having a battery between states three and four, we are consuming four energy. So that's how this is modeled. And using these, we can actually compute the transition matrix. And the details of these computations are given in the paper. So also an interesting aspect of this is that our model is periodic in nature. And the reason for that is that the harvesting variable, so for example, the pattern of uh, harvesting within, uh, within the year, starting from week, week zero and going up till week 51, that is periodic in nature. Since harvesting is periodic, and we can also make the energy use periodic because that is in the application designer's control, the general, uh, what we can do effectively is try to compute the transition matrix for one full year, and that transition matrix apply for all following years as well. So what we can do using this is find out a stationary distribution, which basically gives us the steady state battery uh, at the start of week zero of a given location. And using this, we can also we can find interesting parameters such as the probability of battery depletion uh, at the start of week zero, week one, and so on. And using this analysis, we can effectively design uh, interesting power management policies. So now I'm moving on to the results. Uh, the first results I'm going to present are the sensitivity results. So here uh, we fix two parameters of the energy harvesting node and we vary the third parameter. So in the first experiment, we are, we are setting the solar panel size and the battery size as constant. And what we are varying is the probability of uh, the allowed probability of battery depletion. So as you can see, as we increase the probability of battery depletion on the right side, uh, the energy use that this node can have increases. So the three graphs that we see over here are for three different locations, for Zurich, Switzerland, Madison, Wisconsin, and for Harizat in Pakistan. Um, as you can see here, it does increase, but it increases very, very slowly. Uh, so in principle, the energy use is very sensitive to the, to the allowed probability of battery depletion. 
notice also that we have the log axis over here on the x-axis. Second experiment is regarding when we fix the solar panel size and the, the allowed probability of battery depletion. And what we do is we try to uh, increase the energy storage. So in general, as we increase the energy storage, um, we are not cons as constrained as we, we are with a smaller battery in the winter months, and therefore we can consume larger and larger uh, energy. In general, this is expected to saturate at some point in time, but that is not simulated over here. Uh, the last experiment that we have is regarding the um, how does the uh, energy use vary if we increase the solar panel size while keeping the battery size and the probability of failure constant. So here we expect a linear increase, which is observed for two of the locations. The third location, which is the uh, location of Farizad, Pakistan, we see an artifact. And the reason for this is that when the energy use approaches or is close to the battery capacity, then the model presented in this work is, is becomes more pessimistic. So it is because of the pessimism that we are actually seeing the saturation effect over here. So now uh, I'm going to present some interesting validation results. So as I mentioned uh, earlier in this talk, uh, the analysis framework is supposed to give us stochastic matrix. So on the left-hand side, we are getting the expected energy use uh, in different weeks of the year. The location in this case is also Madison, Wisconsin. So the, the red crosses over here are giving the, uh, giving the values what the analysis framework provides us. The black dots are when we simulate the power management strategy using 10 years of unseen data. So as you can see, there is fair agreement between the, uh, the analysis values and the and the simulated values. So this in some sense validates our model and we can observe the same behavior in the battery as well on the right hand side. We do see that there are some regions where the model does diverge and this is when the battery is actually close to saturation. So when the battery is close to saturation, the model, the, our model becomes more pessimistic and that's when the uh, deviations start. <clears throat> So that brings me towards the end of the talk. There are several results that I have not really presented in the interest of time, but of course you're welcome to go over the publication. And uh, now I'm open to questions. Um, thank you. Do we have questions in the room? So I don't see any uh, hands raised. So I have uh, one comment first. Um, so thank you for your talk first. Thank you for your talk and your paper. So first comment is, um, I, 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 I have the intuition that computing the worst case energy consumption or energy harvesting is totally different from computing the average case and then adding a pessimism term. And this is what you do. You, 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 you compute the average case and then you add the pessimism term, but in your talk, you said, this is to um, encode or to model worst case. And it's totally different. So can you comment on that? Sure, yeah. So the, the models that we developed for harvesting that was using uh, historical data. So using the same location. So yes, I, I completely agree with you that it, those models are not worst case. But it is expected that uh, the behavior that is observed over, over 10 years we would get uh, more or less similar behavior. Uh, so aggregated over one week uh, in the later years as well. If that does not happen, then uh, the paper does mention that there are some emergency modes as well. This is where the adaptiveness comes in that the system will enter. So you now, mean that, yes, so, uh, let me interrupt, let me inter uh, interrupt to show. So you mean that your, your input data is the, for instance, the, the energy harvesting of your solar panel over mm -hmm. during the same week, but over 10 years, okay? And then you add a term. So then indeed, it, this is entirely related to real-time systems where you, where you do measurement-based uh, worst case execution time, and then you add, uh, you, 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 so you observe, you take the max and you add some, some safety margin. Is that correct? 
partially, yes. So the thing is that uh, the worst case that I, that I was mentioning over there, that was only uh, the pattern. So pattern within the week. Mm, okay. So okay, because okay. We, can, we can harvest a little more in the first day and then a little less on the, on the last day. So we had to characterize this uh, pattern as well somehow. So that is basically modeled uh, by the pessimism that I was mentioning over there. So the, 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 the pessimism does take into account that we can harvest less in the beginning of the week and then consume more mm, okay. in the same interval. And then that will still be, uh, the model will still work. Okay. Now again, a safety margin can definitely be added, but that's not something that was done in this uh, work. Okay, and then I have another question, which is uh, entirely different. So first, I still don't see any reactions from the room. So um, yeah, uh, let me ask another one. So could, could you use a reinforcement learning algorithm in your context? Possibly, yes. So the only difficulty over here is that we are, um, in some sense, talking about long-term uh, schemes, mm -hmm. so schemes that work over years. So I'm not sure how long it's going to take for it to converge. Well, precisely, that's the, the, the point of reinforcement learning is that it can take a, a while. OK, so depending on the algorithm you, know, you use and the, on, the, on, the, on the coefficients of your system and so on, so right. you can have a convergence uh, results, so you right. can check. And if you're indeed using the system over years, then all the better for reinforcement learning, because precisely you have the time to, you know that you're going to make mistakes at the beginning, but overall this will average and you will eventually converge to a very good solution. I agree, but the problem here is, I guess, is that the harvesting model uh, that varies quite a bit over the year, so, uh, across the year, across different weeks of the year. So I guess if I want to learn week 50, for example, then maybe I'll have to go over several week 50s to actually converge to a model, which means that I'll take years. But I, I completely agree with you that this is a very interesting problem, especially for indoor solar. So may not be very applicable for outdoor solar, but for indoor environment, this is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And it would be really cool to have a system that learns the environment and then optimizes itself. Something that I would possibly explore later on. Hmm. Okay, okay. So thank you again. Um, thank you again. And uh, we can move to the third, uh, the third speaker. So the third talk is uh, throughput maximization in uh, wireless communication systems powered by uh, hybrid energy harvesting. So again, it will be about energy harvesting. And the speaker is uh, Xiao Jing Q um, from Southeast University. So he received his uh, bachelor degree in uh, computer science and technology from uh, Sochou University in China, 2020. And he's currently pursuing the PhD degree in computer science and engineering department at the computer science and engineering department at Southeast University in China. And his um, research interests are in the areas of uh, cyber physical systems, real time wireless sensor networks, and energy. So, Mr. Biao Jin Qiu, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, uh, I will share my screen. Excellent, excellent. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, and we can hear you. Uh, okay. So you uh, have 10 hello, minutes. Uh, okay. Hello everyone, it's my honor to present our work. Uh, it's a collaborative work with the University of Collecord at the Sydney University of Hong Kong. Um, okay. Uh, in this presentation, I will first give an introduction of the background of the study including some important uh, concepts, the target problem, and the challenges of our work. Uh, in recent years, energy harvesting has been increasingly employed uh, in many IoT systems to provide a clean energy supply for devices with a low energy footprint. Among the many energy harvesting techniques, ambient energy harvesting is a promising one. And it harvests energy from the environment, such as solar and wind. 
uh, most of which are free and uh, thus economically efficient. Uh, ambient energy harvesting often follows the deterministic energy uh, profile. Uh, so we can model it as a sequence of energy arrivals, uh, meaning that a piece of energy arrivals and uh, stores in the battery along with each arrival. Uh, besides the ambient energy harvesting, uh, RF-based wireless power transfer is another widely used technique. Uh, it can provide a stable energy supply for charging devices. Um, in most IoT systems, uh, data and energy are transmitted in the time-splitting model uh, to avoid strong control interferences. Uh, so the time interval can be divided into charging phases and the transmission phases. Uh, in the charging phases, only charging tasks can be conducted and uh, constant power is provided by the WPT source. And in the transmission phases, we only conduct data transmission and the power supply is zero. Uh, as data transmission consumes energy, the energy in the battery increases in the charging phases and decreases in the transmission phases. Uh, however, uh, both uh, ambient energy harvesting and uh, wireless power transfer have the, their uh, advantages and uh, disadvantages. Uh, though AH is uh, uh, economically efficient, uh, it uh, <coughs> uh, depends on the environment and that is uncontrollable. Uh, WPT can provide a stable energy supply, uh, but uh, it lacks a high power density and requires charging uh, in infrastru infrastructures. Uh, to take advantage of the benefits of both AEH and uh, WPT, uh, while avoid their limitations, um, we propose to combine AEH and uh, WPT to power the device. And uh, the hybrid energy harvesting is economically efficient uh, since it harvests energy from the environment. Uh, uh, we, uh, and uh, we can also um, provide a stable energy supply through WPT. Uh, with hybrid energy supply, the energy in the battery can have sudden rise in both the charging phases and the transmission phases due to the ambient energy arrival. Uh, and the last, I will talk about the, the relationship of power data rate and uh, throughput. Uh, in many IoT systems, uh, throughput is a widely used metric to evaluate the performance of the network. Uh, as shown in the figure, the throughput is the area under the data transmission rate curve, and the data transmission rate of a device is a concur increasing function of the power supply. Uh, apparently, uh, the data throughput can be maximized by properly adjusting the data rates over time, uh, subject to the available power supply. Uh, uh, the target problem of our work is to maximize the data throughput with the hybrid energy supply. Uh, in such system, a wireless device harvests the energy from both ambient sources and the WPT and use the energy to transmit the data to the information access point. Uh, we needed to adjust the power supply in the wireless power de wireless device and schedule the data rate and finally maximize the throughput. Uh, for the power supply adjustment, the challenge is to decide the amount of needed WPT energy. As WPT is controllable while ambient energy only arrives occasionally upon the time, uh, we should determine whether and how much energy needs to be harvested by WPT to maximize the throughput. Uh, in the meantime, we also need to satisfy the battery size limitation. Uh, for the data rate scheduling, as WPT follows the time splitting model, uh, the challenge is to determine when to charge and uh, when to transmit, uh, and how long each phase lasts to maximize the throughput. Uh, let's uh, we'll, uh, present the model and uh, formulation of the target problem. Uh, here is the overview of our system model. In our model, point to point the data transmission is started. Uh, a wireless device harvests energy from both ambient energy sources and the wireless chargers and transmission data to the information access point. Uh, the power received by the wireless device through WPT is uh, 
uh, either a constant value or zero in its charging phase or transmission phase. Uh, we determine how much WPT energy we need by determining how long the charging phases are and to obtain the data transmission rate and uh, finally maximize the throughput. Uh, in such system, the target problem can be formally defined. Uh, and uh, the objective is to schedule the data rate to maximize the uh, throughput, while the data rate is determined by the power supply. Uh, and the power supply satisfies the constraints that uh, uh, keeps, we need to keep the device, uh, device alive uh, and uh, not exceed the maximum ca capacity of the battery. Uh, last, I will talk about the optimal offline scheduling scheme uh, proposed in this work. Uh, to obtain the optimal uh, data transmission rate in the offline scheme, we first introduce two uh, lemma in this work, uh, lemma six and lemma seven, and then present the overview of the algorithm. Uh, lemma six finds that the lower bound of the data rate in the optimal policy. Uh, that uh, our OPT represents the data rates under the optimal policy. Uh, and uh, our WPT is the data rate which can be obtained by assuming no ambient energy is arrives in any interval uh, Ti to Tj. In other words, uh, our WPT is totally determined by the WPT power. Uh, the lemma six proves that uh, uh, RWPT is the lower bound of the data rate to maximize the data throughput, uh, as the worst case is that no ambient energy is harvested. Uh, while lemma six works on the case where ambient energy is absent, lemma, uh, uh, lemma seven discusses the case when ambient energy is sufficient. Uh, Ti and Tj are the ambient energy arrival times. Uh, let Rae represents the uh, data rate that can maximize throughput in the interval uh, Ti to Tj when the device is powered or by ambient energy harvesting. Uh, this can be easily calculated by the equation. And uh, uh, lemma seven proves that uh, if Rae is larger or uh, equals to RWPT. The lower bound divine uh, uh, RWPT is the lower bound divine in the lemma six, and uh, the throughput had already be maximized with sufficient ambient energy. That's uh, no WPT energy is needed due to the battery limitation. Uh, based on the previous two lemmas, the offline uh, algorithm can be divided into four steps. In the first step, we divide the time interval into uh, sub-intervals by AE arrival times. And uh, in the step two, we compare RAE and with RWPT in each interval. Uh, if RAE is smaller than RWPT, this means that actual WPT energy is needed to achieve the maximum throughput. Uh, thus, we set the uh, data rate as RWPT and uh, calculated the required the WPT energy. Uh, in another case, uh, if RA is larger than RWPT, the maximum throughput can already be achieved by sufficient uh, ambient energy as proved in lemma seven. Uh, thus, we set the data rate uh, uh, as RAE uh, and no WPT energy is needed. Uh, then the algorithm marks the interval uh, Ti to Tj as processed and uh, find another interval until the enter time is processed. <clears throat> uh, we also propose the online scheme based on the allowances in uh, the offline solution. Uh, if you're interested, you can refer to our paper for more details. Uh, Let's our talk about the experiments in this work. Uh, in the, the experiment, we compare the proposed uh, offline and online schemes with several existing modes. Uh, as the most related schemes, uh, PAEH and PAWPT, uh, only consider the ambient energy harvesting or WPT, uh, we also proposed a baseline, uh, which combine the uh, PAEH and PAWPT. 
and uh, this the the results shows that uh, our uh, proposed schemes uh, outperform the uh, state of ours. Uh, in conclusion, we, we formulate the uh, throughput maximization problem in hybrid energy harvesting systems and provide an optimal offline scheduling scheme and a heuristic scheme. Uh, that's all, thank you. Uh, and uh, all questions and uh, comments are welcome. Um, so thank you. And um, do we have questions in the room? I'm checking, I'm not seeing any. So I, I um, so thank you for your talk. I have a comment to make. Um, so you said at the beginning of your talk that wind and solar energy are free. Well, actually this is not true. This is not true at all. Um, it's free only during the operation of the device. So for instance, if you take your solar panel, when the solar panel is built, indeed, energy is free, but you have to make the solar panel. And this is not free at all. And actually what you have to do is a, a life cycle analysis. And life cycle analysis takes into account the, the time to produce and the energy and resources to produce the device. So here the solar panel, then the time of usage and the recycle time. And you take into account all of this and then you compute what is the cost of the energy? But energy is never free. And it's a, a, a huge mistake to say this. Can you comment on that? Oh, thank you for a comment. Uh, uh, I think so. Yeah, energy, uh, the solar and wind maybe is not uh, totally free. Uh, 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 in this paper, we only uh, I want to uh, take advantage of the energy in the environment and uh, 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 to make uh, the uh, 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 make the uh, energy harvesting task more efficient. But uh, um, uh, I think you are right, and the uh, the solar and the wind also need some uh, uh, infrastructures to uh, uh, get, get, uh, tr tr transfer the. Uh, we, uh, for example, transfer the wind into uh, energies. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But okay. But apart, uh, I mean, this was a minor comment because it was uh, something you said at the beginning of your talk. But the the, the rest of your talk is uh, uh, makes makes entirely sense. So uh, thank you again. Um, do uh, we have uh, other questions? Okay, so we can thank you uh, again and move to the to the next talk. So the next okay, talk is a, is a work in progress. The title is uh, Accuracy Aware Efficient Online Fault Detection for Robust Neural Network Software Embedded Microcontrollers. And the talk will be given by um, Jun Seo Chang from Seoul National University. So he's uh, pursuing his PhD degree in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering in Seoul National University. And his research interests include dependable system design, compiler optimization you see using machine learning approaches. So the floor is yours. Okay, is the audio clear? Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great introduction. Hello, I'm Jun Sun Chang from Seoul National University. Today, I would like to present our work in progress paper, Accuracy Area Efficient Fault Detection Algorithm for Neural Network Software Embedded Microcontrollers. So the importance of fault detection for safety critical neural network embedded systems are emerging. However, most embedded hardware lack robustness. Therefore, software level fault detection are in inevitable. Among various fault detection scheme, we focus on data analysis based model, which does not require hardware modification and is of general purpose. However, applying data analysis-based model on neural network is intricate uh, because it is the due to the open context problems. So in this study, we proposed off-the-shelf control flow error and also software detector applicable on any target program. We proposed control flow matching 
and supervised learning model for software detection. And we also evaluate our model using MNIST image classification neural network program. So our model consists of code insertion, simulation for extracting data and types, and control flow and software detector trained on simulation data. We will cover all by one in, it, in the next chapters. So for code insertion, we developed LLVM pass that inserts code for a basic block index and memory value assertion to the fault detector. While the asserted basic block index are immediately used for control flow matching, asserted memory value is classified to constant or non-constant data, whether it has identical values for all simulations of the same control flow. At runtime, the basic block index and constant data are passed to the shadow detection model, where the detector verifies obtained values with the correct data gathered from simulation. The non-constant data are passed to a deep detection model, which will be introduced in the next slide. And this selective fault detection system minimizes detection delay and improves the resilience of the detector. For deep detection, we divide a special sliding window one class support vector machine. For instance, if the SVM model labels current window as correct as the first figure, the window slides to the next window. However, if the SVM model labels current window as incorrect as the figure two, the window enlarges and applies SVM to the enlarged window. This reduces false positives while preserving low false negative values. To evaluate our detector, we devise a fault in injection model that performs briefly on the target program asserted value. We experimented varying error rate, briefly numbers, and also briefly position distribution. For result, the control flow error detection recall and precision was 100%, and the precision of software detection was over 99%, and the recall was 99.9% .9 in most cases. For future work, we plan to implement our work by implementing target program and shallow detection on tricor MCUs and the deep detection model by callback to higher performance systems or via network. We are also working on robot operations by partially replacing erroneous values at runtime. This is the end of our presentation, and we are open to questions now or in the post session. Thank you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah, OK. So thank you for your, because I, I, I had to put a, a headset. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I have two questions regarding fault tolerance. So first one is, what is the cost of fault tolerance in your, in your system? So you, you, you must have some overhead to protect for protection. And uh, so what is the cost in terms of uh, computation time, uh, uh, memory, or whatever? Okay, so first of all, uh, we dismiss the cost of detection delays because uh, we detect we detect faults in in distributed systems. So, so our main constraint is first of all is uh, how much delay occurs in the actual running program. So, uh, the performance overhead must be the uh, so in this in the most detailed paper which will be coming out soon. Uh, we measure the code size overheads of uh, because mm -hmm. class of our code insertion process and also the runtime of our program. The second one is the is the memory and uh, computing power consumption of the uh, detectors. So for shallow detection model, we we were able to implement in a uh, very low power embedded boards, yeah, STM32 boards. And for the deep detection delay, we are currently working on the worldwide operation and also to minimize the computing power re required for the deep detection models. Um, okay, so thank, thank you. And uh, uh, another question uh, also regarding fault, fault detection this time. So is your technique related to what is called golden check? So you know, in golden check, what you, you know what, what should be the value of some variable at some point in the program, you know that Okay, with this input, uh, this variable must have this value, and if it has another value, then you know that uh, a failure has occurred, and this is called a golden check. So is it yes. related or is it related to what you use? Is it something that you could use but do not use today? Can you comment? 
Oh yes, we're kind. It's it's kind of similar, but it's like because the uh the weight and bias are keep changing for like a lot of these for the neural network application. So we have to match the boundaries for each value. So like using the traditional methods, it's not it was it, it wasn't impeccable. So we have developed okay. this kind of methods. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um. Do we have questions in the room? So again, I'm checking the, the hands that would be raised. And so if no, we can thank you again and we can move to the next talk. And the next talk is also a work in progress paper. The title is Dynamic Offloading of Soft Real-Time Tasks in a <laughs> SDN-based FOG computing environment. The talk will be given by uh, Niraj Kumar. Uh, so he's a PhD uh, student in computer science and engineering from uh, I IIT Patna, India, and uh, he holds a PhD and he currently is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at Rajiv Gandhi uh, Institute of Petroleum and Technology uh, in India, and his research interests include uh, real-time and cyber-physical systems, scheduling, computational geometry, and intersection of machine learning and systems. So, uh, Dr. Kumar, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, so hello, all. So, the only constant that we observe all around is the change. And we have been observing like significant changes. In fact, sometimes paradigm shifts and characteristics of computational workloads, computing devices, and a lot in the networking concepts and practices. So, to begin with, the workloads can be categorized in a class of systems called soft real-time systems, uh, like multimedia systems. So for such systems, usually we do have some timing constraint, but violation is allowed with some penalty. If we talk about computing paradigms, so yes, the cloud computing has been a big success, but then there are certain issues with the cloud computing systems, primarily the higher latency. And to complement the cloud computing, now the work computing is being uh, explored and the idea is to bring along with the ACE computing certainly so the idea is to bring the computing near to the devices where the data is being generated so that we can reduce the latency requirement and then we have the three tiers of uh, computing the terminal nodes which are generating the, the data which is to be processed in the fog layer or maybe in the cloud layer and a lot has changed in networking so now for example we have software defined networks so that allows us to separate the data and the control plane so that the flow rules can be updated dynamically considering the network status. So this trio of the soft real-time tasks as workloads, which may be generated uh, from, from a large number of IoT devices that must be processed with a lower latency requirement and computing on the FOG devices with SDN support. But then there are certain challenges that must be resolved to take all the advantages. So for example, for the workloads, now scheduling is not sufficient. We need to have some kind of offloading because the fog devices, they are highly unpredictable. They may become unavailable, like they're dead or maybe migrated if they have the mobility or they may be overloaded. So we must have some kind of uh, offloading. So with this motivation in this work, we are exploring the offloading techniques uh, from the unavailable or overloaded fog devices. And the objective is to minimize the overall penalty due to deadline misses. So this problem uh, of loading decisions, uh, we need to determine actually uh, which tasks will be uploading and then offloading location. So these are the two sub problems that we need to solve. So this certainly can be formulated as an optimization problem with the objective to minimize the total penalty but then computing optimal solution is uh, certainly going to be intractable. And uh, this, the offloading processes, they need to run when the system is online. So the, the, the computation time for the offloading must be small enough. Uh, so certain heuristics must be developed. And uh, we have actually done some initial studies and uh, like we have found that as expected, so certainly offloading has uh, potential to reduce the overall penalty. Uh, but yeah, so this is not all, a lot has to be done. So currently we are exploring um, a heuristic solution for, for, for offloading and to extend this task model to a more generic uh, 
model uh, called weekly hard real time task. And uh, certainly one mention is uh, regarding the scheduling. So actually the scheduling and offloading, they are uh, like tightly coupled problem. So we are also exploring in the direction with the other characteristics like heterogeneity of the fog devices and considering energy and cost as a part of objective. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Do we have questions in the room? So again, I don't see any hands raised. Um, I have, I have questions, uh, several questions. So you presented, um, well, you took, you mentioned heuristics. So did you also compare with optimal solutions? And if so, uh, how were the optimal solutions computed? What kind of algorithm did you use? Yeah, so heuristic in the comparison, we do not yet have the results. We are working in that direction. Uh, so actually we are looking for some search-based heuristics. So we will be searching. Uh, so actually we have started with the branch and bound in A star, and then certainly we'll be going to uh, some heuristics uh, with which we can compute the solution quickly and, and near, near optimal, suboptimal solution. So that's the idea, but yeah, we do not have the comparison results uh, for optimal solution. So we have formulated this as an ILP problem. It is a linear programming problem, and uh, we have tried to solve that on Gurubi Solver. Okay, so you compute the optimal solution by formulating an ILP problem and using an ILP solver. So this gives you the optimal yeah. solution, and you also have a heuristics. So you said yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, near near optimal. So how close are you to the optimal? Do you have a formal proof of uh, uh, suboptimality, so like uh, an no, approximation factor, not. or do you have experiments? Tell you that uh, we you do are... not have it, but uh, I mean, uh, we are working in that direction to, okay. to have the process that will give us suboptimal solutions. Okay, what about scalability of the ILP? Uh, what kind of yeah. uh, what size of uh, systems are you able to optimize? So, actually, currently we have uh, we had had certain like assumptions. Um, so, for example, th there are many things, so this is a very complicated problem and a complicated combinatorial optimization problem. So currently, to even to compute ILP solution uh, for us, even a smaller system, we had a certain uh, certain uh, assumptions. So for example, many things we have assumed uh, that, that, that will have to relax in a real system. So for example, uh, like communication cost currently, so the, the offloading can be within a cluster or that can be inter-cluster or in fact, that can be to the cloud as well. So we'll have to consider the network resources as well, the congestion in the network resources and those things. So those things we have not yet considered. And uh, so, so, yeah, yeah. System... so yeah, so based on your assumptions, uh, uh, you're simplifying your assumptions. So what is the size of system you're able to deal with your ILP solver? Uh, so, I mean, how many devices? I mean, uh... Yeah, yeah. So we have experimented uh, for 20, 50 and, and 100 devices. And so for 100, and for 100 device, the ILP solver manages to find the optimal solution? Uh, no, so for, for a very- No, I'm talking about the track, optimal. So can... I'm talking about the ILP and the optimal solution. I'm not talking about the heuristics. I know that the heuristics scales. I'm talking purely about the ILP. So what is the size of the systems you're able to deal, to handle with the ILP solver? Sorry, can you please repeat? Okay, I'm not talking about the heuristics. I'm talking about the ILP solver. So you're using an ILP solver. So my question mm -hmm. is, what is the size of systems you are able to handle with the ILP solver? What size? How many devices? Yeah, so we have experimented for 20, 50, and 100 devices. But when yeah, fog but... device is 100, then we'll have to keep the number of tasks that I need to upload. And that must be reduced. So for, for uh, I, I cannot recall, it was, I think, around 100 tasks we can manage. With the ILP, 100 tasks and 100 devices? Yeah, so if I am increasing the number of fog devices, that's also one variable, the number of fog devices. Okay. So that okay. I can offload. And the number of tasks is another variable. OK, OK, thank you. Thank you. So thank you again. And uh, uh, our next talk will be the, the last one of the session. And it's also a work in progress uh, paper. It's uh, accelerated matrix factorization by uh, approximate computing for recommendation systems. The talk will be given by uh, Yining Wu from Shanghai University. He's a postgraduate student at Shanghai 
University, majoring in computer science and technology, and his research expertise and interests include uh, machine learning acceleration, sparsity, and optimization. So Dr. Wu, the floor is yours. Uh, hello. <laughs> We can hear you, but we don't see the, the, the slides. Uh, Are you able to show your slides? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm, uh... Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we see. So, yeah, excellent. So, go on. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, my name is Winning. I'm studying. Uh, I'm studying in Shanghai University of China. Uh, today, I'd like to present my work, Accelerating Metrics Factorization by Approximate Computing for Recommendation System. Recommendation system play before the load can leave a massive emission of load at present. Um, uh, 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 meanwhile, with the emergence of edge-based surfaces, it's necessary to reduce the computational time. Uh, uh, it's not to reduce the computational time uh, uh, with the uh, uh, it's, it's to reduce the computational time and uh, consider the limited resources of index of same devices. Uh, what's more, uh, uh, however, the computational uh, complexity uh, greatly increases for larger scale uh, recommendation system. Um, making matrix factorization not suitable to be operated at edge. So we propose our method to reduce the uh, computational time uh, of the matrix factorization in recommendation system. Um, so many experiments have found that the sparsity of user matrix P and item matrix Q, uh, which is obtained by matrix factorization, uh, is, always, is often cost grid uh, it is not often cost grid but fine grid, uh, which means the small elements are irregularly allocated in the matrices. Uh, so we need to better transform um, the uh, the sparse matrices. What's more, we also find that uh, the sparsity, uh, the trends of the sparsity, uh, considering all dimensions generally hold, uh, it will be uh, used in later method. Uh, next, I will briefly introduce our method. Uh, due to the sparsity of matrices P and Q is often a uh, fine grid. Uh, so uh, we propose a method to reduce, uh, we propose a method to arranging the, to rearranging the sparse matrices as shown below. Uh, we first computed the uh, sparsity of the latent factor of matrices P and Q, and then joined the, the sparsity uh, of the latent factor. And finally, uh, rearranging the matrices of P and Q uh, according to the ascending order of the uh, uh, sparse, uh, uh, joint sparsity. Uh, it's, uh, it's notable that uh, 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 the rearranging only need to be performed once during all the iterations, uh, as we have shown earlier, that the, 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 the trains of the sparsity, considering all dimensions, generally hold. Um, as the matrices, uh, uh, as the matrices P and Q have been rearranged, uh, we can uh, expect that and the values of the following elements of P of the row or the column uh, um, is more closer to zero. So, um, uh, for each row by column multiplication, uh, we can uh, retain the result until the first animal uh, uh, till the first uh, elements of the value uh, closer to zero appears in the row or column uh, to reduce the computational time. Um, the 
uh, our uh, through the experiments we, we can we can find that uh, our method can realize up to 1.1 speed ups um, considering different volumes of such a T. Uh, and the user's preferences predicted by our approach is similar to the ones produced by the conventional method as for the threshold T. Uh, as for the threshold T, uh, we consider the values, uh, the absolute values let in T to be uh, close to zero. And then we, uh, by observing the relationship between the uh, latent fact k and runtime, we can find that a more steady increase and shorter runtime can be observed from our method when k is further squared uh, increase. Uh, so uh, we can uh, expect that uh, um, a greater speed ups can be realized if uh, the scale of the recommendation system is largely is further enlarged. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your listening. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, completely different from the other ones, but uh, still very interesting. Uh, do we have questions in the room? So again, I don't see any uh, hand raised. So um, the, the, the question I have is uh, regarding the uh, approximation. So. So you mentioned that uh, you you um, you take advantage of the sparsity of the matrix, and you compute the uh, approximate solution. So, what is your uh, approximation algorithm, and what are the consequences, uh, both theoretical and practical, in terms of the machine learning uh, algorithm? Uh, as, uh, uh, can you speak uh, again? Ah, so. If, if you come back uh, a few slides earlier, so slide number five, I think. Can you show slide number five? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Please. Oh. Is this page? Uh, no, no uh, the, the previous one, this is number six. Ah, okay, so no, uh, the, the previous one. Huh? No, the previous one. Is this? No, no, previous, previous. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, again, one more. Yes. Yeah, okay. So this is approximate matrix multiplication. So what is the approximation? And what is the, the, the so how far are you from the exact result? And is it a problem in terms of the machine learning algorithm? I, I can't, uh, uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, this vector is the, uh, is one, is a row of the matrix P and this vector is a column of the matrix Q. Uh -huh. uh, uh, through, through the, uh, through the rearranging, we can find that uh, um, the, 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 the sparsity of the following elements are more uh, close to zero. So the sparsity uh, of the uh, following uh, factor is, is larger. So, we, so um, we can expect that if, if uh, there are uh, a zero, in the factor, uh, we can uh, stop uh, the multiplication because the uh, last elements uh, ha is has a larger property to uh, to be zero. Okay. Okay, I see. Okay. So uh, so thank you again. Uh... And thank you, uh, all the speakers, and this will conclude the, the, the session.